a special operation to rescue hostages has gone terribly wrong. The nation that took the hostages used to be very friendly to the Central Croat Alliance network, but since their government underwent a regime change, they have been very isolated on the global stage. This new government has made other nations feel uneasy. I am Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. This new government has others so worried that they are considering an invasion. Fighters are inbound, and it appears that they are attacking the airfield. A Karanian K-4 attempts to scramble, but never gets a chance to engage the enemy. It's not Sikan that has orchestrated this invasion, but Kyran's neighbor to the west. Sikan will still attempt to negotiate to get the hostages freed, but the situation on the ground has become a little bit more complex. The airstrikes were just the beginning. Now comes the ground assault. The regime change has caused Kyran's neighbor to become belligerent. Their government is fearful of having the revolution spread to their country. Yet, when Kyran was friendly with the Central Croat Alliance network, they are able to purchase some high-end CCAN equipment. The opposition, however, has been friendly with the communists. Therefore, high-end equipment from both sides of the Cold War will be facing off against each other during this conflict. While none of the superpowers are directly involved, their equipment will be on full display. Quran's neighbor is attacking with multiple armored divisions. However, the bulk of their forces seem to be concentrated in the south. Although unprepared for the invasion, Quran is launching everything they can back towards their enemies. They are attempting to slow down and blunt the attack. But it will not be easy. For the moment, Quran is outnumbered in the field of battle. But this isn't just a fight over land and resources. These governments have different ideologies and different religions. Some are calling this even a type of holy war. Quran continues to throw everything they have at the invaders, attempting to at least slow them down a little bit. The goal being to give their nation enough time to set up their military and organize a counterattack. From appearances so far, the fighting is going to be fierce on both sides. Much of the terrain between the two nations is mountainous, meaning there are only a few locations where mechanized combat like this is even possible. That would make this area strategically important to both sides. It appears that the tanks are advancing without infantry support. Koran's local populace begins flooding the marshes in this area. That will make it very difficult for their enemy's tanks to traverse this terrain. It also appears that this attack has had the unintended consequence of rallying the Koranian people around their new government instead of opposing it. That means that this conflict may last for a long time. And while action on the ground will be slow going, due to the nature of the terrain, much of the fighting will most likely take place in the air. The first attacks against the airfield failed to do any significant damage. And on subsequent attacks, the Koranian Air Force is now better prepared. The attacking Air Force is approaching in their MiG-23s, but opposing them are CCAN developed K-14 fighter jets. In a first, both sides are using aircraft that make use of variable sweep wings. This time, the defenders were ready, and the MiG-23s appear to be no match for the highly advanced K-14. Both sides are making use of very fast and highly maneuverable aircraft, but the electronics available on the K-14 are a lot more advanced. The K-14s are also equipped with the long-range Phoenix missile. Although Koran didn't start the war, their advanced CCAN equipment is helping give them an edge against their opponents. The Communists and the Central Croban Alliance Network will continue to closely monitor this war and intervene if needed. Even with all of the craziness happening on Kerbin, the Central Croban Alliance Network continues to develop their space program. Recently discovered technologies should allow the Alliance to develop and construct a much larger, more capable shuttlecraft. The idea behind the shuttlecraft is that it will be reusable, with the goal being to reduce the cost of putting things into low Kerbin orbit. The one currently under development is a prototype and a technology demonstrator. 
The goal will be to launch this shuttle all the way up to the edge of the atmosphere and then, hopefully, safely land it again back on the runway. As the shuttle comes in for a landing, the tail will split, acting as a kind of air brake. The wings and control surfaces are there primarily just to help the craft glide back to the runway and land safely. They will not be very useful during the ascent stage, though. The large wings are capable of holding liquid fuel. Perhaps, in a future design, nuclear engines will be incorporated with the space shuttle. The viability of the nuclear engines has already been proven. Perhaps, in the future, a more advanced version of this shuttle will be used to send crews further out into the solar system. One of the most advanced and unique features of this shuttle are its engines. The KS-25 Vector engine has the largest gimbal range of any engines that SeaCan has yet developed. Engines like this would mean that the shuttle would not need to be mounted on top of a large awkward rocket, but could instead have an external fuel tank mounted to the belly of the shuttle. Some engineers are suggesting that this would be a safer and more simple way to launch a shuttlecraft. Although it is possible that there could be issues if the shuttle ever had to do an abort during launch. With that, the prototype has been assembled. Now, it just needs to be mounted vertically for its test launch. Jebediah, Bill, and Bob have graciously volunteered to crew the shuttle on its maiden flight. Jebediah throttles up the engines and begins going straight up. The goal of this flight is not to reach orbit. It's just to test some of the basic systems, the new engines, and landing techniques for the shuttle. The vector engines are very powerful and quickly accelerate the craft. It then easily coasts over 70 kilometers in altitude. Because the craft has almost no horizontal velocity, Jebediah will have to be very careful on this re-entry. Using the RCS thrusters, Jebediah attempts to point the shuttle belly down in an attempted belly flop maneuver, as he calls it. He's using the blunt underside of the shuttle to help slow it down as it descends in the atmosphere. As the shuttle descends down to 10,000 meters, the wings become more effective and the control surfaces more responsive. Engineers are interested in Jebediah's thoughts about how the shuttle handles. Jebediah responds, it flies like a brick. Nonetheless, Jebediah is able to line up with the runway. The shuttle does seem tricky to fly, but Jebediah, being Jebediah, does manage to land it safely onto the runway. He deploys the chute and lets the shuttle roll to a stop. By all appearances, the design is functional. Out in the Joule system, the Voyager probe continues to make new discoveries. It currently is in a stable orbit around Joule between Val and Lathe. While all the different moons of Joule are interesting in their own way, scientists are currently the most interested in Lathe. This moon has oceans of liquid water on its surface and what seems to be oxygen in its atmosphere. If there was another place in the Kerbal system that could support life, Lathe would most likely be it. Is there something in orbit around Lathe? I am Echo 3, and thanks for joining me on this discussion about the Cold War. I will see you next time.